Proyecto Internacional de Investigación y Práctica Profesional en Psicología. La verdad es que, bueno, es el resultado de un trabajo conjunto con Claudi, que, que bueno, la verdad que fue muy, muy, muy gratificante, eh, porque, bueno, permite, la verdad, brindar al público de lectura español este excelente manual de tratamiento, un tratamiento eh, con un nivel de evidencia muy, muy fuerte para la prevención de la recurrencia en depresión. Y, y bueno, la verdad es que a mí cuento una pequeña anécdota de cómo conocí a Claudi en el Beck Institute en, hace ya cinco años, eh, haciendo un curso, ambos, eh, y, y bueno, estábamos conversando, nada, de bicicletas, eh, ya, hoy de Amsterdam, de, empezamos a charlar por eso, de cómo llegar en bicicleta al Beck Institute, si era posible, si era peligroso, si no era peligroso, y, y bueno, a partir de ahí comenzamos a, a conversar, la verdad es que como cualquier otro, otro compañero de ahí del, del curso, y en un momento me doy cuenta que es Claudio Pop, que yo la había citado muchas veces, y fue como a posterior, fue muy gracioso el insight que, que tuve en ese momento, porque bueno, de repente estaba conversando con una de mis referencias bibliográficas en las presentaciones sobre tratamientos combinados, combinación... Eh, de medicación y psicoterapia en, en este tipo de depresión. Así que bueno, la verdad es que después de, de años de ese encuentro y bueno, la, bueno, la posibilidad de, de haber estado en, en el Centro Médico de la Universidad de Amsterdam gracias a la invitación de Claudi, poder pasar allí una temporada eh, viendo cómo trabajan con su excelente equipo, tanto desde el punto de vista profesional, eh, científico, como desde el punto de vista humano. Eh, bueno, la verdad que esto es una, una gran alegría que podamos realizarlo. Eh, nos gustaría que la próxima vez pueda ser presencial, pero bueno, esta es la, la manera en que estamos encontrando durante la pandemia de continuar con nuestra actividad científica eh, por el momento. Bueno, no, no voy a decir mucho más, lo dejo al profesor Eduardo Gigan, quien amablemente va a comentar el, el libro, y luego a la misma autora, Claudia Boxing, que... Eh, va, va a hacer una presentación sobre su contenido también. Bueno, buenos días. Bueno, es un placer para mí participar de, de, de esta presentación y de darle la bienvenida a la profesora Claudia Bochting y darle en unos minutos el, el piso para que nos, nos hable de, de su intervención. Yo voy a señalar algunos aspectos eh, importantes de esta intervención. En primer lugar, los trastornos depresivos, la, la depresión mayor, eh, son los trastornos más frecuentes, son las psicopatologías más frecuentes y por eso se lo ha llamado muchas veces coloquialmente el refrío de la psicopatología. Por lo tanto, cualquier intervención que hagamos sobre depresión va a tener eh, necesariamente un gran impacto en, en salud mental gran impacto en la reducción de sufrimiento y en el uso virtuoso de, de recursos. Algo que aprendimos en los 60s, en los 70s, es que la depresión es muy tratable, pero la sorpresa negativa que arrojó la investigación es que si bien los pacientes responden muy bien a las intervenciones, a los episodios, en muchos casos conservan todavía una gran vulnerabilidad a las recurrencias, a las recaídas, y por eso desde los años 80 ha habido un interés creciente en desarrollar intervenciones para la prevención de las recurrencias. Hay muchas intervenciones en este sentido, se, se hizo muy famoso en su momento en la terapia cognitiva basada en la mindfulness, también más recientemente las intervenciones de Watkins, ¿no? la eh, terapia cognitivo-conductual enfocada en, en la rumiación, y el modelo de la profesora Pochting, que ven reflejado en este volumen publicado muy recientemente por Acadia en castellano, es un modelo más estándar, si por estándar nos, nos referimos a un modelo más, más bequiano, donde eh, se trabaja con algunas estrategias eh, propias del, del modelo cognitivo de la depresión, a las que se suman algunas estrategias originales muy específicas de este modelo, y tiene el mérito de haber demostrado 
que con una intervención bastante económica, bastante eficiente de ocho sesiones, tiene un, un poder importante para la prevención de la recurrencia. En realidad esto es uno de los ejemplos clásicos de intervenciones que, que necesitamos a escala pública. Como mencionaba Christian Gray, la profesora Bochting trabaja en el Centro Médico de Ámsterdam. En, en ese tipo de instituciones necesitamos, sobre todo en el ámbito público, intervenciones que sean eficaces, que sean eficientes, que con un costo eh, relativamente bajo prevengan problemas frecuentes y de ese modo podamos eh, contribuir desde la psicoterapia con lo que sería el aspecto más flojo de la intervención antidepresiva. Como ustedes saben, los antidepresivos tienen muy buena eficacia, una eficacia similar a la psicoterapia, pero la gran eh, limitación que tienen los antidepresivos es que cuando los retiramos no son tan buenos para la prevención de la recurrencia como lo puede ser la psicoterapia. Entonces, para no tomar más tiempo y, y cederle la palabra a la profesora Bochting, el gran mérito de esta publicación en principio es que esté disponible en castellano, tiene al final de la eh, publicación una serie de, de instrumentos psicométricos que resultan útiles tanto para la aplicación del modelo como para su utilización en general, como la escala de actitudes disfuncionales. Es un procedimiento eh, relativamente sencillo que está eh, bien descrito en el libro y que se puede aplicar a pacientes que son muy comunes en la consulta, muy frecuentes en la consulta, y su objetivo, como el título lo, 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 lo establece, es la prevención de un nuevo episodio de depresión mayor. Bueno, espero que Cristian haya podido traducir al menos el, el, lo, lo central de estas palabras para, para la profesora Bochting, y entonces le cedemos la, la palabra a ella. Now is your... Your turn. Yes, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, incredibly kind um, invitation. Um, I would have loved to come over to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and to face you all face to face. And um, yeah, it's horrible that we have to do it like this, but maybe uh, in time we find another occasion uh, to, to meet each other and maybe That would be really nice if some of you in the meantime already read a bit about relapse prevention, this specific method, but, and maybe also tried out some of the interventions. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so just give me a moment to see if it's all working out. I guess so. Um, and now it should be fine. Is that okay? Okay. Yes? Fine. So hopefully you uh, can see my screen. Uh, I also would like to thank Christian Gray for being so kind to try to translate on the chat uh, what I'm uh, saying. I apologize, my Spanish is uh, very, very minimal, so I think you would not like it if I would try to present it in Spanish. Um, Christian instructed me to uh, do something that is very difficult for me, and it is to talk slow so that he can uh, keep up with translating it on the chat. Uh, I would also like to, to ask you, so say if that it's not clear or I'm, I'm talking too fast or too slow or forget something important, please put it into the chat and uh, Christian can uh, mention this out loud so that you can actually correct me. Um, and before I continue, I would also like to thank uh, Christina Tenreyo, maybe I don't pronounce it in the right way, and Christian uh, Garey, because they were incredibly kind to put a lot of effort in translating this uh, preventive cognitive therapy for relapse prevention in Spanish. 
and um, that is really extremely kind and I know it's a lot of work uh, so I would like to uh, thank you both for all the work on this. Okay, so yesterday I found out that we have something in common in a way. Here you see Maradona, he said enough, passed away. And I also read on the news that it's actually the beginning of, of a couple of days of national grief. And uh, what we have in common that uh, only a few years ago, Johan Cruyff passed away, also a footballer, and uh, it really also took some days uh, to recover. And back then, when uh, um, uh, Christian actually did a research stay at our University of Amsterdam, um, I thought maybe we can do nice things, but instantly he sort of moved me away and went with my husband to the... Ajax Stadion to football and I was not allowed to come. I forgive you, uh, Christian. Okay, we're talking about something serious and that is relapse in depression. And of course, the most important question is why should I bother? Because if you want to work on treatments for common mental health conditions, so that is anxiety disorders, depression, and also addiction, it's already hard enough to make sure that most people actually respond to treatment. And sort of 50 to 60% respond to current treatments. So you could say, stop bothering about relapse. Now, in depression, it's not an issue anymore. You have to focus on relapse because we know even after the first episode, 50% of the people will have another episode. That's only after one episode. And maybe what's important to realize, this is also the case for people who had a very clear reason to be depressed. For instance, maybe you recognize this maybe from your practices or from research. Uh, uh, we know that if you lost a loved one, this can be a trigger for depression yeah? because life events are the most consistent factors for triggers for depression. So, but even if your depression was triggered by something horrible as, as losing a life loved one, then still the risk of relapse is 50% after the first episode. So that's important to realize it's all over the place. And to make you even more depressed, we also know that the risk of relapse increases up to 90%, so almost everyone, after having experienced three or more episodes. So it's very clear, the more episodes, the higher the risk of relapse. And we also know that if you are remitted, but you do have some symptoms. So for instance, a patient that says, oh, I feel far more better, but the only problem is I have some concentration problems. And it was a bit more than before my first depression. We also know that this increases the risk for lead relapse. So that means that relapse is now seen as a recurrent condition for most. And the rates for relapse are comparable to bipolar disorder. And for bipolar disorder, if you go to a local market and ask someone who is selling the fish, do you think me mania, hypo, have bipolar conditions might be recurrent, but then in a different way? Even the person who doesn't have a university or high school or whatever, they know, yeah, that's probably something that will recur. But this also holds for depression. And if you're not in the field of depression, we know, for instance, for addiction, also the main problem for addiction is actually also the relapse and recurrence. It's also sort of comparable uh, rates. Within the anxiety disorders, you also see high 
levels of relapse, but this depends on the specific anxiety disorder. And we need far more studies to study that. And if you say no, but in, for instance, post-traumatic stress disorder, this is not the case. Yeah, there are actually studies claiming even after a successful treatment that also there, there is considerable relapse, although it's lower compared to depression. Okay. So this is the case about why should we bother about relapse? Now, what is the most strategy? All over the world, the most used strategy is continuing antidepressants. And that is because people who seek treatment for depression, most of the time they get antidepressants. And of course, I'm aware that Buenos Aires has the highest density of psychotherapists. So maybe in Buenos Aires, it might be a bit different, but I assume this is psychotherapy that is basically more like psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And maybe the severely depressed patients still get antidepressants in Buenos Aires as well. I don't see Christian or Eduardo nodding. So if I'm wrong, just do this. Okay. No, you don't. Hello. Okay. Eduardo. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I'm not an expert on Buenos Aires yet, but I, I would love to dive into that. So to summarize, if people get treatment for depression all over the world, most of the time they get antidepressants. And if they want to prevent relapse, then they continue after remission with antidepressants. And indeed, there is evidence that this indeed might or that it is indeed reduces risk of relapse. But there are problems. First, there's no evidence when to stop antidepressants. So it means we don't know when to stop. So this have led in the past to guidelines that actually recommend to continue lifelong. And there's another problem. Uh, we know that almost 75% uh, of all people taking antidepressants after remission stop within two years or are non-adherent. So they take too low dosages or they take one day and not the other day or they stop it for half a year and start again. And all these kind of procedures, they do not offer you protection. And there is of course, for instance, pregnant women. There are pregnant, we do not know for sure whether continuing antidepressants during uh, pregnancy uh, is safe for the offspring, for the babies. If you're interested in that, I also did a lot of research on that, uh, including the effect on the offspring. Uh, so then just in the end, send me an email and I'm happy to send you also um, the articles. By the way, uh, also, if you want to have all the articles, la 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 la, I'm happy to send it to you. And later on, I will also give you a website that gives you all the citations of the articles. Again, if you do not have access to the articles, just send me an email and I will make sure I collect all the questions and send it to you. Okay. So given that most people that get treatment are actually treated with antidepressants and given that antidepressants is the most used way in the world to prevent relapse, already more than two decades ago, there were some groups that thought, okay, what about if we develop an intervention, psychological intervention, yeah, we are a psychological conference here. So what about if we develop a psychological intervention that specifically is designed to prevent relapse and recurrence, and that is applied after remission. And there were two types, one of them back then was the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that was 
developed by Mark Williams, Sindel Segal, and also uh, um, uh, Teasdale. And sort of in the same time frame, I developed back then at the University of Amsterdam, preventive cognitive therapy. And this preventive cognitive therapy is described in this, in this book. Now, of course, it's always nice to develop something, but there are so many types of treatments. The crucial issue is, is it indeed effective? Does it do the work? Um, now, I'm going to summarize and then I go into the detail. For mindfulness-based cognitive therapy in the past two decades, there is substantial evidence that indeed if you start eight sessions and you include specific meditation, not medication, but meditation elements, that that indeed protects against relapse over 15 months. The most studies examine this over 15 months. And there's some evidence that it also might be an alternative for antidepressants. I will discuss this later on broader. I also developed preventative, of I developed preventative cognitive therapy. And in preventative, preventive cognitive therapy, there is no meditation. And there is a clear reason for it because I thought, okay, um, we do have effective treatments for depression and among them are cognitive behavioral therapy. And the theoretical model actually states that underlying beliefs, underlying beliefs about yourself, the future, others, like I am no good or in the end, I'm a loser. Or if people really know me, they see I'm a bad person. These horrible kind of dysfunctional beliefs or schema. Eh? Um, that these are actually the vulnerability factors for a relapse. And therefore, I thought, okay, let's go back to the cognitive model, the cognitive theory, and see if we can develop specific interventions that are acceptable for people that are remitted, that are doing really good. And that's actually what we did. So I developed back then an eight session intervention. So comparable number of sessions that was also delivered after remission in eight weeks. And we also found in a couple of randomized controlled trials, we'll talk about it later, clear evidence that this was effective for preventing relapse and recurrence, first of all, over two years. But given that I'm a bit of a negative person, I always think, yes, yeah, something works. And then maybe a day after the effect is gone. So I continued to follow up for 10 years and we found that the effect even prolonged over 10 years in randomized control trials. Talk about this later on. Anyhow, so what, is, what are the ingredients of this intervention? So it's focused on the theoretical cognitive model that is in fact an information processing model. So the slide you see now it's, I actually think this is a quite cool slide. It's an updated version of the cognitive model because it not only includes, for instance, the schema, like I'm no good, I'm worthless, but it also includes, for instance, what happens with the brain yeah? and what happens with bias attention and so on. So it's an integrated neurobiological psychological model. Now, so it's the intervention has three elements. First, it focuses on the schema and beliefs, like I'm no good. And we use very specific uh, intervention techniques. That is, we use the activation of positive network to challenge these beliefs. And to make it more specific, we actually use imagery and fantasy to disentangle people from really strong 
beliefs that are sort of ingrained in their system, like I am no good. And why did I choose that? Now, there are two reasons for it. First, remember, I start in this project with people who are actually remitted. So they had a really tough time. Sometimes they had also already psychotherapy. And the idea was, if you're remitted, you don't want to go through the pain again because you're already happy that you're doing really good, right? So the idea was we have to select interventions that are attractive to people instead of only going through the dirt, only going through the hard negative part. So I thought this intervention should also, it should be not only feasible and short, but it should also be attractive to do. And I can tell you, it's not only attractive for patients, it's also very attractive for therapists to do. And I know that now because we trained like really a lot of therapists and a lot of experience with it. And there's another reason why I wanted to work with challenging schema using positive imagery, because there's a lot of experimental studies out there, for instance, by Emily Holmes, who was back then in Cambridge and now in Sweden. And this, this experimental stuff clearly indicates that if you want to create a new uh, interpretation, so a new learning association, it is far more easier to achieve that if you activate a positive representation. Because everything what you've learned is always there in your brain. You cannot stop, you cannot take away what you have learned. That is a bit of sad news. A long time ago, we thought that is possible. So everything that you have learned is there. So according to Bruin, uh, you have to have make a new learning association that actually competes with what you're, it should be more attractive than what you're already learned. And then you already understand why, uh, why a positive way of learning new things might actually be more feasible. So there were two reasons. One, just a practical reason, because otherwise no one who is remitted wants to do it. Two, because of these really cool experimental stuff of, for instance, Emily Holmes showing that it's far more easier to recollect information and to have an impact on your effect if you uh, expose people to positive imagery. And these kind of findings in the meantime, so we are now 20 years ahead, is even more supported by, for instance, the work of Anke Ehlers in Oxford. And so there is even more evidence that really points in this direction. Okay, so how are we doing? Uh, actually, uh, Christian, I do not see the chat at this moment. So, so please alarm me if I'm yeah, not sorry. doing too good. Uh, uh, the, uh, the name of the, the researcher in Oxford. I couldn't hear you. Uh, that you mentioned about positive imagining. Emily Holmes. 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 Could Emily you write Holmes. it, Edward, if you know? Emily Holmes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Great. And and Anke Ehlers. Okay. Are there any urgent questions ah. before I continue? Eh, ¿Tienen preguntas ahora? Si quieren podemos hacer un ratito ya que paramos para hacer alguna pregunta. Si no, continuamos. Bueno, continuamos. Puedo we'll, we'll continuar. Okay. Right? okay, you are all so patient. Thank you. <laughs> so, this is really nice. So, we have this intervention. Eight sessions, which is three in uh, three in sorry, three three ingredients. One, focused on these belief and schema. Two, focused on a better like brain training on remembering positive de details. I will talk about it. Uh, maybe I should, yeah, 
uh, and, and yeah, I will talk about it a bit more. So actually making sure that you are better able not only to install, so for remember your positive experiences and affect, but also making sure that you get a training that it's also easier to be activated so that it is a re autobiographical memories and also positive effects are more activated. And this is a simple training that will be done with, for instance, specific types of positive diaries that are described in the book. And if you maybe think about this, for instance, say you, you, uh, may, yeah, say you have a bit of a hard time and you have to work hard or you have to study hard, many people, what they do is actually, they, they do something that actually helps them to remember something positive. This is one of the reasons why many people have, for instance, a screenshot, how do you say, a screensaver, with, for instance, a nice photo from a memory from your holiday, or why people have children on have photos of children on their desk because it reminds them of something positive hopefully yeah um so we use positive memories and memories of positive moods to actually regulate ourselves but it's also important to problem solving so <clears throat> one of the interventions is actually <clears throat> a sort of brain training on encoding positive materials and the last part is that people learn themselves how to make an individual prevention strategy and this is not just a crisis strategy but this is also this also includes your personal psychological passport and that takes into account uh, how you for instance respond to difficult situations so for instance if you have a belief like in the end, everyone will leave me. Yeah. You can imagine that if you're anticipated with a reorganization of your work or in your research department, or even when your colleague is leaving, that this might activate a lot of negative thoughts and so on. You can anticipate that. So what will be in the plan is actually you write down your own psychological makeup, your own psychological passport, and already make plans. How do I deal with expected situations like this? For instance, by making sure that you are more project proactive to make sure that, that you keep in contact with this person because it's for you far more important than for someone else. Have, for instance, by making monthly rituals. Yeah, even if it's online, to cook together online. Okay, so how about the evidence? Now, the first trial um, actually was a randomized controlled trial, and uh, that was started in, what was it, 2000 or something back then. And uh, what I tried to do there is I included 172 patients who were remitted, but they all were recurrently depressed. And that's important because we know that's an ultra high risk group. So more than two, two or more episodes. They were remitted and this was assessed with a skit interview and la 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 la. Please feel free to contact me to send you all the articles so that I don't need to talk about all these details, but it's randomized. And given we had no evidence back then yet, we randomized to either treatment as usual, and be aware treatment as usual after remission is for 40% no treatment at all because they are remitted. And there is a category that receives uh, antidepressants continuation and a category that has some kind of booster sessions in mental health care. Yeah? And we compare that to treatment as usual, and then the preventive cognitive therapy, eight sessions, eight weeks, started after remission and then stopped. So that was uh, evaluated, and our main outcome was time to 
a next depressive episode. And this was assessed over two years using a clinical interview, the skit. So I definitely cannot recommend you to do something like this because this is takes a very long time, but we succeeded to do so. So what were the results? We found protective effects of the addition of these preventive cognitive therapy on top of treatment as usual over 10 years. And we did also a follow up after three, five and a half and 10 years. And we found to my surprise that the effects they are still there after 10 years. So that means if you look at the group after 10 years, they are still better protected against relapse than the group that did not receive it randomly. So this was a first promising study. And uh, as far as I am concerned, within the field of psychotherapy, now yeah, as far as I know, I think within the field of psychotherapy, this is the the only study worldwide that's demonstrated in a randomized control trial such a long effect of psychotherapy. So in a randomized control trial, because then we know for sure it was the addition of these interventions. Also within the field of other psychotherapeutic approaches like psychodynamic or interpersonal therapy, this has not been found. We do find some protective effects of interpersonal therapy, but if you stop the booster sessions, the effect is gone. And this was stopped, eight weeks and stopped. Okay, now, of course, uh, I'm a bit of a pragmatic person. I thought, what about if we make a self-help version? So like a booklet, this is called Between Dip and Dream, a bit of a popular title. So really a self-help booklet for people who went to the general practitioners and who said, and, and, and were remitted from uh, one previous episode. So we developed that and this was supported by, yeah, sort of counselors that actually are also working in uh, general protection practitioners offices in the Netherlands. We did a randomized control trial comparing 248 remitted uh, sorry, remitted uh, individuals also add on to cognitive therapy versus or add on to treatment as usual and not. And we also found there that it indeed protects against relapse, but this was done over one year and the effect was smaller than in this study. And in this study, it was really delivered by licensed clinical psychologists. Whereas, sorry, in this study, whereas here, it was a self-help intervention. It was only guided by counselors. So it was more from a distance. It was one weekly guidance, but only to see, did it work out? How can I help you? But they did not do the interventions by themselves, only when, when patients had problems to do so. Okay, so these were also promising effects. And then we did a next randomized control trial to do something that is actually quite obvious because since there is there are meta analysis that clearly demonstrate that if patients have already been treated with cognitive behavioral therapy during the depression if that's an acute treatment we know relapse risk are lower so what we wanted to do here is to examine what if you start preventive cognitive therapy after remission on cognitive behavioral therapy, does it still add to a better, pro uh, better protection against relapse? And this one is an interesting one because it, it has been found before that with a long-term cognitive behavioral therapy after remission, then indeed you can reduce relapse risk. Robin Jarrett did great work on this in Texas. So we wanted to sort out, to cite uh, Eduardo Keegan, would it also be possible to use an eight session preventative cognitive therapy after respond to cognitive therapy? Now, what's the outcome? Clearly we find also effects if you give it after people have been treated in the acute phase with cognitive therapy. Good, and then 
we thought, now, sorry, we did a lot of randomized control trial, and so I, uh, I'm boring you with this, but this one I will be short. So then I thought, ooh, this is really cool. How about to make it far more easier, we make an internet-based or mobile-based intervention based on preventive cognitive therapy. And this was really cool with all kind of, oh, looks really nice and video clips and all that. Took us three, three years with all the right persons to make this. Really cool. The interesting part is we did find an effect on three months. So people get more, in, like they, there is less increase of symptomatology after remission. But on our main outcome over 15 months to two years, we do not see any effect. So the internet-based intervention is not effective. But that's why you do research. It's not enough to develop a cool intervention that is based on the theory. It's also important to evaluate whether it's indeed effective. Because it's yeah, horrible if all these people get these internet interventions and think it will protect them so they do not do something else. Whereas, yeah, if you have studied it, you would find out it doesn't work. So for instance, I had to put a lot of pressure on it not to sell it, this program, to all kinds of people. Because there were all kinds of commercial partners interested to sell it. This is not offered in the Netherlands and hopefully also not internationally. Okay, internet interventions does not do the work. Okay, uh, maybe you could ask, was it guided by a... Cl cl uh, clinical psychologist, yes, it was guided. So this was a guided internet intervention, but still did not do the work. So it's probably not strong enough. Yeah? The doses is not strong enough. So this is the uh, site, just to convince you that it was not boring to do, but maybe you perceive it as boring. And it was also not cost effective. That might be also important. Okay. So we're almost through this, maybe a bit of boring talk about evidence. Overall, we see in, in the meantime, it's already six randomized control trials that preventive cognitive therapy in eight weeks after remission on recurrent depression really reduces relapse over time from 15 months to even 10 years. But this is not the case for internet interventions. So that's the evidence. And then of course you have the problem if you work on this field, you get the question from clinicians, but also from patients. So can I stop my antidepressants or is it maybe better, better to add it to antidepressants? And this question we did not answer with all these randomized control trials. So therefore we did a three arm time trial and we included even more remitted recurrently depressed uh, patients and they all after remission still use antidepressants and they were randomized to continuing the pills plus these eight week preventive cognitive therapy versus stopping antidepressants. So tapering antidepressants and this psychological intervention versus antidepressants. Yeah, and our main outcome was time to relapse over two years. Our prediction was pills do better than the psychological interventions. And our prediction was pills plus this psychological intervention do better than the pills alone. It's easy, right? Now, it sounds easy, but this, this trial was definitely a, a nightmare and it took a lot of time with help of a big team and three PhD students to finalize this. Yeah, these are some characteristics uh, and maybe important to know that most of the people included used SSRIs. Okay, these are the results. Now, this might be a bit of a complex, uh, uh, sir, yeah, uh, what is it, um, Kaplan-Meier curve, but it's simpler than you think. You see below the follow-up days, so two year, and you on top you see, of on the, the right side, you see the proportion of recurrences. So you have to remember the higher, it means the more negative. 
And what did we find? First of all, we predicted that adding preventive cognitive therapy on continuation of antidepressants is better in reducing relapse risk than only antidepressants. And we clearly found an enormous effect on top of antidepressants. And that is, and that is the green line you see here, we find a, found a 41% risk reduction of adding eight sessions of eight weeks on top of antidepressants over two years. And, but what's also very interesting, we also found that overall the lines, the blue and the red line, actually they do not significantly, significantly differ and also not clinically significantly. And the blue and red lines are actually either antidepressants only or stopping antidepressants and getting the preventive cognitive therapy. So we found the group that actually stops antidepressants with this intervention has not a higher risk of relapse than the group that continues antidepressants two years. Although in the beginning, you see the first what is it, three to four months, the, there is a bit of a higher risk in the people that stop antidepressants. And that's not really strange because it's, it takes you out of your balance to stop antidepressants. And this is not only with antidepressants, but this is also the case, for instance, if you stop cocaine, not that I'm saying you use cocaine, maybe another um, example. For instance, if you stop uh, painkillers after you've used it as a lot of time or a benzo diazepine. I see in my screen that someone raises a hand. Yes, you have a question. Will you, will you escribir tu pregunta en el chat, si querés? Or... Parece que fue un error. Ah, okay, okay. It was a mistake. Okay. okay. Okay, sorry. So overall, we, have a we couple, find... We have 10 minutes. Or... Yes, okay. So <laughs> overall, I, I will go to, um, to a practice then, but mm -hmm. overall we do find adding this on top of antidepressants reduces risk of relapse substantially. And this has not been found for mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. There they do not find an effect on top of antidepressants. And in line with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, we found that the people who stop and get one of those, these psychological interventions are as good as the people who continue antidepressants. So that's really cool. And uh, very recently, uh, uh, we got a paper on a meta-analysis on the topic uh, uh, accepted in British Journal of Psychiatry, and this the, I don't need to talk about it in detail, but this completely supports that as well so this intervention as mindfulness might be an alternative for antidepressants, but only this intervention, preventive cognitive therapy, has an additive, so an extra effect on top of uh, antidepressants. Okay, this is to sum up everything. Um, yeah, of course, we want to know what works for whom. I only want to, um, to mention one of my PhD students who did a marvelous job bringing all these data together. And we're now analyzing what works for whom. Um, this will be out, no, this is on the review at the moment, but I can already maybe say a bit if you don't tell anyone. But it seems to be the case that it's all over the place. So even if you have patients with a far, like very, very bad clinical characteristics, like for instance, more episodes, more severe uh, previous episodes and so on, then still both options do comparable. So still so psychological intervention is an alternative for continuing antidepressants. So that's pretty cool. But wait for the publication before you maybe uh, apply it. Okay, now I go back to these ingredients. I already told you we work on schema by activating the positive network. And we do that with a specific technique that is, by the way, out there already a long time, developed by Christine, or at least demonstrated by Christine 
uh, Badescu. And what you do, you go to your negative belief, for instance, I am no good. And you try to create with your patient to fantasize about what you wish to adopt in your wildest dream. So what you wish to think of yourself. So instead of I'm no good, for instance, what could be I am a terrific person or I'm the magnet of the world. So it's something that doesn't have to be realistic at all. And the idea is thereby you do the challenging work. We work on recall and encoding of specific positive feelings and memories and autobiographic memories. And we work on a formulation of a relapse prevention plan using the psychological passport. And this is actually developed if you go through the manual step by step, you get there automatically by end, by the end. So it's actually something that leads to it at the end. If you follow the structure, you will. Okay. Given that we do not have a lot of time, I would really like it if you would do would take a moment for yourself and do an exercise with me. And Christian was so kind to help me a bit on this. So what I would ask you to do is to take yourself an, as an example, or maybe a patient or someone you know, and go to a dysfunctional belief. For instance, la idea es que hagamos un ejercicio práctico y ahora traten de centrarse en alguna creencia que ustedes tengan claramente disfuncional, que tengan ustedes o alguien que ustedes conozcan, puede ser un paciente, puede ser un amigo, un familiar, o ustedes mismos, pero traten de traer a sus mentes esta creencia disfuncional. Sí, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Christian. Thank you. And now hold this, take a dysfunctional belief. For instance, I'm no good. Now I want you to close your eyes and I want yeah close your eyes and I want you to think what would you wish to think of yourself in your wildest dream instead of for instance I'm no good and don't be modest Ahora traten de cerrar los ojos e imaginarse ustedes mismos en sus sueños más alocados En, en lugar de en esta creencia negativa. O sea, una imagen que sea exactamente lo contrario, una imagen positiva sobre eh, lo contrario de esta, de esta creencia negativa que al principio eh, yeah. detectaron. Definitely. So the question is, what would you wish to think of yourself in your wildest dream and imagine how do you look, stand, sit and what do you feel? And I give you I'm a horrible person. Two minutes. Y entonces les voy a dar, soy una persona horrible, les voy a dar solo dos minutos para que se imaginen cómo lucen, cómo se, mientras están sentados, cómo, cómo se, se sienten con esta nueva creencia positiva. ¿Dónde sienten esto? ¿Qué, qué emociones sienten?
Okay. Thank you very much. So, of course, now I do not have the time to ask for all of your experiences, but I'm very curious on this. But imagine that you do this repeat repeatedly for at least half an hour with the guidance of a clinician. And that you do this to not only fantasize about what you wish to think of yourself, but you also are going to develop an absolutely unrealistic idea, a schema, an idea about yourself. The thing is, many people with experience with, remitted, with depressed episodes get also by doing this completely different, different experiences. And the main goal is not to believe that you are going to be fantastic or the magnet of the world, but the main aim is that it actually creates a new learning path. So a way that you're actually more able to evaluate yourself against this very positive <coughs> fantasy belief and to get to less extreme and more realist realistic ideas about yourself. Now, I just wanted to say, we, of course, we cannot practice this all, but if you're more interested to it, eh, please have a look at the book. I'm not trying to sell the book because I will also open up for all of you the website so please try to write it down including your own passwords and there we also provided also english i'm sorry not spanish yet christian we should have made it all kind of english examples of how you can do these exercises with your patients and not only the fantasy but also how you get back to reality again and evaluate this evaluate this schema this was just to give a tiny little idea about how we work on relapse prevention. So um, thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank again Eduardo, of course, for this awfully kind introduction, but also Christian for being uh, yeah, so kind to not only translate it with help of Christina, but also again to um, moderate this in a, in a beautiful way. And hopefully we do have time for one or two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Claudie, for, for such a nice presentation. And, um, bueno, ahora sí tenemos tiempo para, para las preguntas, comentarios. Había una pregunta. There's a question about the use of uh, technology, for example, in, in case that some patients have difficulties to imagine, to do the, the imaginary work. Um, could you interest, uh, use, for example, digital, digital technologies as a uh, virtual reality or something like that? Ask. Oh, this is really a great question. Uh, so whether I use the uh, for use other ways, indeed, um, at this moment, I'm actually testing out a virtual reality application, but not yet for relapse prevention, but for treatment of depression because it could indeed be the case that then it's more easier for uh, people to also do this uh, fantasizing work. I'm not completely sure whether it has the same effect. This, this, this is definitely something where actually we're trying to test out at this moment. Yeah. And we also have now for young people, because we know also in young people, relapse risks are already high. We have now a supermarket of five, no, no, eight apps that each target a different mechanism. For instance, behavioral activation, avoidance, um, now all kind of and cognitive beliefs and so on. And we're trying to sort out, sort out if you deliver this personalized, whether this might be be effective, whereas the others were the other was not. Okay. Okay. I think we have to get going. Eh? Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I could say something to you all, and uh, I would like to thank you for your enormous patience. And uh, if you do have any questions or you want to have something on the email or something, please feel free to uh, contact me. And um, even if you are planning to try this out. 
uh, and there are some difficulties here or whatever, uh, feel free to contact uh, contact me or Christian or whatever. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. Yes, we have to finish now. Pero bueno, muchas gracias a todos por participar de esta presentación. Eh, mañana vamos a continuar hablando de intervenciones digitales y de Network an Analysis en la mesa coordinada por Eduardo Kigan a las 10 de la mañana, ¿no Eduardo? Mañana a las sí, 10. mañana eh, a las 10. Así que bueno, vamos a continuar con estos temas y vamos a hablar un poco, hay una pregunta sobre tecnología, vamos a hablar un poco sobre eso también. Así que los esperamos mañana. Y, well, thank you again, Claudi, for your presentation. It was a pleasure for me to, to work with you and continue in the future, I hope. <laughs> um, and essential, I hope, also. Um, well, good luck. Thanks for joining us, Claudi. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. uh, ciao a todos. Gracias. Nos estamos viendo en el Congreso. Bye-bye. Okay.